The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, episode 746 for Monday, January 28th, 2019. Good readings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where you send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found. We answer your questions. We share your tips. We share cool stuff found from all of us. It's like car talk for Apple users, where the goal is each and every one of us learns at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include Captera at captera.com slash MGG, Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com, and a new sponsor that I'm going to wait to tell you about a little bit later. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How you doing today, Mr. John F. Braun? Uh, just, you know, easing back into the usual thing. Okay. After all the uh, sensory overload and excitement of CES, I think we're all... Uh, all I'm right, wound down from that. All right, good. Well, not I you st- though. I'm, I yeah, still have something going on. I still have all kinds of stuff from CES that we haven't talked about yet. Um, <laughs> some of which we'll talk about today, and some of which actually, actually will be coming in future episodes. So it's yeah, you know, it's good. CES is awesome for that. Like, just so many cool things that we get to see. I want to start with some quick tips today, though, and the first comes from Abimanyu, who, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, who says. I have a quick tip for the Apple TV. When you're watching something on the Apple TV, if you tap, not press, tap the trackpad of the Siri remote one time, it shows you the time remaining, uh, you know, on a little bar across the bottom of the screen. And, uh, it, you know, the point at which you're at, it shows you the time remaining. And then at the rightmost end of the seek bar. Uh, and then at the current point, it shows you, you know, where you are in the time elapsed and all that thing. What's cool is that if you tap the trackpad a second time right after the first tap, so a double tap, if you will, the current position of the scrub pointer will now change to show you the current local time, and the rightmost end of the seek bar will change to show you the exact local time when the video would end if you keep playing it. He says, I find this really cool and extremely useful when I have to let someone know the exact time I'd be free without having to do any kind of time calculations in my head. Note that this only works while the video is playing and that it won't work if you have the video paused. Also, it only works for the native video player interface on the Apple TV, for example, and it won't work in a custom playback interface like what the YouTube app has. And I hope this helps. Of course, this helps. This is one of those cool things, man. Really nice find. Uh, Great little quick tip. So thank you for that. So cool. Had no idea. Use the Apple TV all the time. Never noticed it. Because, you know, we probably wouldn't stumble on it otherwise. That's what quick tips are all about. It's good. Right? Though some do. As we say, it's a happy accident. It's a happy accident. Unfortunately, I don't have one of those. So I guess for for us uh, people with older models, I guess the way to get that number is to hit the pause, as he pointed out. Well, but you just, you don't get that number, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You you have to do the math, unfortunately. I mean, nothing. No, a a lot of videos... If you pause while it's on the Apple TV, you'll get, you should get a a scrub bar. So I think you missed what he said. Uh, If you tap, you get the scrub bar that shows you the current elapsed time and the total time. If you double tap, the scrub uh, bar changes to show you the current actual local time, like for you in Eastern time. Got it. And then the end shows you when in Eastern time it would end, which is the cool part. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah, I know. You don't have to do the time math. It's good. Uh, another quick tip that came up actually in a TMO staff meeting this week, and it was Kelly Gamont brought it up, but uh, John Martellero mm-hmm. wrote it up, is a quick tip to remind us all about quick look. And and this is like the the epitome of why we created quick tips in the first place. Anyone who uses quick look knows to use it all the time. And anybody who doesn't, when you see someone use it, it's like magic. So the idea is quick look is built into the finder and other file dialogues throughout Mac OS. And you can highlight a file and just hit the space bar. And if it's a file 
of a type that the finder can interpret or display, it will show it to you. Or if it's a media file, it will actually even play it for you. So if you need to, if you want to see what a picture looks like, boom, you just hit spacebar and it shows it to you. You don't have to open an app, nothing. Same with a pages document. I think Word documents even work this way. It's worth trying with just about anything and is a super handy feature and really can speed your your travels through the finder and through your file dialogues. Pretty cool, right? I, I assume you use Quick Look all the time, right, John? When I need to. When yes. You, yes, of course, when you need to. Yeah. And now you, you may ask yourself, are there ways to extend the things that Quick Look can understand? And the answer is yes. And where do you want to look for that sort of thing, Dave? You probably want to look in your library folder, and then within that folder is a Quick Look folder, and within that you're going to see, may see, some files that have a .ql generator at the end of them. So, for example, I see Dropbox and Pacifist as two apps here that installed something there. So, Quick Look can be extended, and if you'd like to know how yours has been extended. Um, or so, just, tell me where uh, this no, is again? It's in uh, if home? You go to your library folder. In your home folder or the main one in the system? Um, I think either one could. Okay. It. Like a that lot of things. Sense. It could either be your system library. But if you go, I mean, just, just for kicks, yeah. go to your, any library folder and look for a quick. Yeah. I see. I've folder. got the Dropbox one and a set app one yep. on this machine. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. All right. Just thought I'd toss that in there. If you want to understand what else is being quick looked. I found a go. website called quicklookplugins.com. I don't know Sweet. how. Uh, up to date this is, but it shows plugins for various different types of files, including one that I found for SRT files, which are subtitles. And that would be a handy thing to be able to look at. For yeah. Video process. yeah. 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 So I'll put, I'll put the link to that there, but uh, yeah, that's pretty yeah, good. I don't think because uh, apple's uh, as we've seen dave apple has developed more stores for different things like for example now right. there's kind of a safari extension store i don't think there's a quick look store that is in, endorsed by apple so uh good find yeah cool huh i had i i, I don't know that there? i knew I, that that no there might be yeah there might be. i don't want to launch the app store while i'm podcasting here because you know well no I'll just it's a uh, funky you've got a separate machine so yeah. Well, Apple's usually pretty good about. It. So if I go to apple.com slash quick look, nah. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> huh. Cool. Well, uh, that's good. I didn't, I don't think I knew that you could extend that with third party stuff. See, this is why we do this show. If I knew it, I forgot it. So there you go. Uh, all right. Moving on. We've got more tips, more cool stuff found, but, uh, but let's, let's take a question here from listener Bill who says, I am trying to remotely help my sister with an iPhone battery problem in the fall of 2017. So about a year ago, I gave her my then two year old iPhone 6s when I bought an iPhone 8 early last year. She took advantage of the low cost Apple battery replacement program and got a new battery installed. She recently contacted me and said that her phone battery was performing so poorly that she can literally watch the battery percentage indicator count down. So far, we've tried rebooting the phone and then upgrading to iOS 12.1.3. No improvement. And he showed some screenshots of this. Uh, and it says uh, her 88 percent. It, it says that her maximum capacity is 88 uh, percent, which is fine. Uh, and uh, he says and then the second one shows 10 day battery usage. And he says uh, what strikes me as odd is that the thing that's using the most battery is 28 percent of it is used by home and lock screen. He says, by comparison on his phone, home and lock screen usage is only 4%. He says, is this indicative of some system level problem in my sister's phone? And would a restore be the best option at this point? Or do you have other ideas? So um, it's an interesting issue. And I, I think um, I think you may wind up doing a restore on this, uh, which you have to do with a computer if you really, truly want to. Uh, wipe out the operating system and reinstall iOS there. If you just want to wipe out settings, you can do that in settings, general reset, erase all content and settings, but that doesn't re replace the OS. That said, I think this issue might come back um, because what you're seeing when you, when you see home and lock screen there, 
there's a lot of things that fall under home and lock screen on iOS, but the one that is generally most responsible for battery usage is notifications. And it's almost like they should include notifications in this just to give you sort of a hint as to what's going on. Anytime your phone has to wake up, i.e. for a notification, that's using the battery. And all of that is attributed. It falls under the umbrella of home and lock screen. So if you're someone that uses the smart notifications or the enhanced notifications, I guess we call them, to reply to text messages and do all sorts of things without actually, say, launching launching messages or whatever app it is, that could be the reason that most of your battery is being consumed there. But you also said that she's seeing her battery fall precipitously, like in front of her very eyes. That may mean that there's some other background process that's not being reported here, which is something we've seen that perhaps the settings reset would would fix. So that's that, that's the information I have. And maybe that helps you or someone else understand what what you're seeing in that scenario. What do you think, John? Yeah, I was looking at my phone here and I got a home and lock screen at 13 percent. Now, I think in my case, it's probably a combination of what you mentioned, which is notifications. But also, if you have your phone, which I don't know how many people do or don't, but I have my phone set to wake on motion. OK, so pick it up. Yep. And, and that's also going to the lock screen. So I, I don't know how often you do that. I would say you'd probably in all likelihood, if you have notifications on, that would happen a lot more than you picking up and putting your phone down unless you're really, you know, <laughs> jonesing for some notification. Sure. Some well, you know, they, they do trigger our dopamine receptors. So, you know, that, that there's there's some truth in in the term like, jonesing for notifications. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I'm like, is anything going on? Well, if I pick up my phone, it'll tell me if there is. <laughs> now, you can keep your phone from waking the screen when you get a notification by putting it face down that in, I believe right. the six S is receptive to that trigger as well. So oh. that when your phone is face down, it it'll still buzz or sound depending on how yeah, you mine buzzes. I, I, I almost never have my phone sound on just because I don't want to annoy people around me, even when I'm home. Sure. It, but whatever you have it set to, it will still do with the face down, but it won't light the screen oh. until you, you know, until you lift it up. And I'm, I think the six S does that too. So, uh, right. yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Good stuff. Hopefully that helps bill. Um, but it might, you might need that erase all content and settings that that may well be a, a thing for, for her on this one. All right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing though, is that I'm trying to remember the article that I read the other day, but it was basically saying, Hey, you know, if you install an update to iOS, um, you may notice that your battery is going to be draining because we're re-indexing all sorts of things. I don't know if they ever explicitly say that when you install it, but that's sometimes the case under iOS is that it's doing a lot of work because they just added some new features or they have to you know, recatalog it or whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I Totally. Yeah. It, it, anything can run in the background and it, the app, I've seen apps run in the background that do not show up if you look at the app switcher so that that doesn't necessarily keep things from running it depends on what provisions the app has because some apps can just launch themselves without you actually seeing them so yeah yeah all right um moving on let's go to paul here who asks he says i'm making a carbon copy cloner backup of my 2013 15 inch macbook pro running sierra will i be able to boot my 2009 24 inch imac from that and will i still be able to boot my macbook from it after booting my imac from it these are good questions uh and anybody that's been using a mac for say more than about 10 years might remember a day when there were different versions of the os uh that would you 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 would not that's the right way to say this when mac os was installed on your machine it would get a machine specific version of of that of that version of mac os that wouldn't necessarily be able to boot other macs nowadays based on my experience anyway every mac os install is what i would call fat in that it has everything to boot every mac that that version of mac os is able to boot 
Um, so as long as your 2009 iMac can run that same version of Mac OS, which in this case, it is a yes, uh, then yeah, that disk, that drive should boot that machine, no problem. Um, but it wouldn't hurt to test it now before you're in a scenario where you actually need to rely on it. And yeah, once it boots that machine, it doesn't change anything fundamentally about that drive. That uh, You'd still be able to boot your your 2013 MacBook Pro with that too. The only scenario that, that would be a problem is if, say, you upgrade to Mojave, which I think your 2013 MacBook Pro can run, but your 2009 iMac cannot. And in that scenario, then no, Mojave would not boot on your 2009 iMac because Mojave won't boot on a 2009 iMac, if that makes sense. What do you think, John? I did quite a bit of background researchy type stuff on this. And let me tell you what I found. Oh, my goodness. All right. So first, let me highlight this thing. So one, I found an article here and it's titled How to Install Mac OS High Sierra on an older Mac. Okay. Ah, you got it ready. OK. <laughs> um, and it goes into detail. So one, um, well, actually, I'm going to step back a bit here. So. How do you know what operating systems your Mac can handle? Well, I looked, uh, so I, I want to provide one data point here, Dave, uh, uh, to follow up on what you said. Our friend Mac Tracker is a wonderful database of all sorts of, of trivia and lore about Macs here. But one thing that it shows is that for that particular Mac, which I believe he indicated was the iMac 24 inch early 2009, if you click on the software tab, it's going to say, well, here's the OS it came with, which was 10.5.6. And it's like, Maximum OS 10.11.6. I would use Mac Tracker as a guide for how difficult it's going to be for you to install an OS that's outside of the maximum OS and can indicated here, which I believe is information from Apple saying, well, we really don't support running an OS beyond, in this case, 11.6 on this 2009 machine. Does that mean it won't work? I don't think so. What, what I think it means is that you won't be able to download the installer in that machine because it's going to be like, well, no, that this machine's too old. But Wait, kind of the end what? run that we're taking here. A 2009 Mac won't run. Oh, that's right. That 2009 Mac, Mac might not run Sierra. Right? And I'll go into a bit of detail. But, well, th but I want to take the information here in context. So, so this is the information that is coming from Mac Tracker, which I assume comes from Apple. Even though Apple doesn't necessarily officially support it, there may be ways to get around this. Now, one, which I think is kind of a clever end run, is you make a clone and you boot a clone drive. So even though you can't run the installer for the OS you want to put on there on the machine itself, you should be able, and I've, I've done this and you've done this, Dave, is that as you pointed out, it's pretty much portable in that you get an install almost. Now, when Wait, I, what when are I you talking find, about? Hang on. I, if this machine won't run anything past 10, 11, I, I don't think it's going to boot from that clone what I'm saying is even though this data is in Mac tracker, I don't know if I think it may still work. And, uh, and I found reports. No, here. I don't think so. I well, don't. and then I found an article here talking about how to install high Sierra on older Macs, including pre 2009. And the claim in this article from Mac world is that you can do so. Really? So you may need a hack. Oh, with a hack. Yeah, there was that hack that existed from DOS Dude or whatever, right? That, yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's the article that I found and then DOS Dude. So somebody wrote a hack. And okay, yeah, but, 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 whoa. You need to put that, you need to build Mac OS Sierra with that DOS Dude hack in order for it to boot on a 2009 oh. iMac, right? right. You, it won't just, it won't just, like, if you build it on a clone, no, if that OS is not built. So I, I misspoke. I I thought this would run Sierra, this machine, this 2009 machine, but it will not, not without a hack. And that though, like lots of people have used those DOS dude um, hacks. And we'll put a link to that certainly in the show notes, how to, you know, how to use it and where to get it. But, but just having that clone. So no, the answer, I, I have to retract. So and you don't my believe statement. that booting off of the clone with high Sierra on that machine would work? No. Okay. I don't think so. I don't know because I, I don't have enough. You actually have a, a wider hooray of hardware than I do. Yeah. I, I, I don't have anything here where I can even test this theory, though, though, you know, I poked around and found people that said, yeah, it may work on older Macs. Now, the thing that, that they do bring up is that some older Macs will not run high Sierra because it, uh, although 
the, what you said is correct and that you pretty much have a universal install. Um, they point out that on some older machines, something like the Wi-Fi chipset is so old that High Sierra does not include a driver for it because uh, it's probably like you know 802.n or B or whatever, or just a Broadcom product that just was deprecated or something. Sure. So they do purge, from what I from what I can tell, they do purge drivers for certain classes of things like Broadcom Wi-Fi controllers. Um, so you're not going to get every driver for everything. Right. <laughs> in high they're they're going to, I mean, they just have to do that. I mean, they can't support like 802.11B chipsets. It's like, well, dude, why? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know what I'm saying? But yeah, that article goes into some detail about what you can expect when trying to run or install the new OS and the older hardware. Yeah, it won't. It, it, right. The DOS dude stuff is, is meant to make it run, but, but, just getting it installed, like you said, on a, a clone or something is not enough. You have to then take the DOS dude stuff and patch whatever install oh, it is in order to get it to run because it doesn't have the drivers for that particular hardware. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. I'll I'll put a link uh, uh, in the show notes to DOS dude um, stuff. It's DOS dude one. Yeah. Dot com and they do have one for Mojave as well. So if mm. you want to run Mojave on an unsupported Mac, you you can head down that path too. Most reports I've heard are that this is not stable. Um, so you know, caveat emptor. Yeah, yeah. Well, I saw mentions as well. They were like, okay, and and another restriction is that some versions of Mac OS, if they don't see a certain breed of Intel processor, like beyond a certain revision right. or code name they're gonna be like nope don't get it nice catch so, i should have i should have checked mac tracker before answering this question because it would have told me no no this is one of those el capitan is the end machines so um, I'm, I'm, I'm here for you man yeah no that's good and and the listeners as well yeah no thank you that's great <laughs> uh all right uh can we take a minute john and talk about our our first sponsor Absolutely. All right. I'd like to thank Hair Club for being a sponsor of Mac Geek Gab today. I know what you're thinking. What does Hair Club have to do with Mac Geek Gab? We ask this question, too, because we want to have sponsors that fit for you. And as I learn more about Hair Club and who they can help the most and how they can help, it became obvious why they were interested here in Mac Geek Gab and how much of a great fit it really is. Look, Confidence is important. We know that, right? We talk a lot about that on this show by way of making sure you know what you're doing when you're doing things. And sometimes one change can make all the difference. And Hair Club knows this. And that's why they're inviting you to become part of the Hair Club family to see how getting the most out of your hair can change your life. John and I are extremely fortunate middle aged men in that we both have full heads of hair, sometimes more hair than we even need. And that is a wonderful thing. In fact, we want that wonderful thing for all of you. So does Hair Club. They understand the emotions you're feeling and the questions you have. They are the leader in total hair solutions with a legacy of success that lasts over 40 years. And whether you're looking to revitalize the growth of your own hair or to learn more about the latest proven methods for hair replacement or restoration, Hair Club's professionally trained stylists, hair health experts and consultants will craft a personalized solution to ensure you feel your best and get the most out of your hair. See for yourself just how powerful great hair can be. John and I can tell you how powerful it can be. And here's the cool thing. If you go to hairclub.com slash MGG today, you get a free hair analysis and a free take home hair care kit, all valued at over 300 bucks. Again, that's hairclub.com slash MGG for a free hair analysis and a free hair care kit. Hairclub.com slash MGG. Experience your hair and your life at its best only with hair club check them out hairclub.com slash mgg our thanks to hair club for sponsoring this episode all right and it's time now to talk to christopher we've got some cool stuff found to handle my friend christopher says in response to mac geek 744 and the discussion on apps to aid in removing files associated with deleted apps i wanted to give a shout out to my favorite app for this task app trap he says, while it's not updated often, it doesn't seem to need it. 
its one task is handled perfectly. It sits in waiting as a preference pane, watching what files are installed along with an application outside of the app's own container. When you trash an app, it asks if you want to delete the associated files that it's kept track of. It says, I've been using it for years with no issues. And the best part is I don't have to think about it at all. The one thing to watch out for when updating an app and the old version is trashed, it will ask to delete the files, which you probably don't want to do. Luckily, he says there's a warning right in the dialogue about it. Well, thanks for that, Christopher. Very good stuff. I like that. So that's different that, than the other ones that seem to just kind of go based on their own databases. AppTrap uh, seems to like just watch what's going on. I like that. That's pretty good. Right? Good, Mr. Braun? I think so. For some bizarre reason, I search for AppTrap on this machine and have an email from 2011 where uh, someone was talking about it. And I said, oh, yeah, I use it. Oh, I don't anymore. So why is that? Why is that? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I thought it sounded familiar for. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Huh. Cool. Well, thanks, Christopher. It's always good. Cool stuff found revisited. We like it. It's good. Uh, I have found something cool, John. Uh, The folks at Anchor have partnered with a company called Eufy, E-U-F-Y, which makes something called the RoboVac and now makes what's the the model of the RoboVac is the RoboVac 30C that works with your iPhone. And uh, and it's 240 bucks, which is much lower than it was a week ago when I put it on our list here. So check that out. That's a good thing. Uh, and it, you can, uh, it, it's a, you know, it's a circular, just little vacuum thing that will intelligently go and vacuum your house. So we have our set, you can trigger it with your phone. You can trigger it with a remote that comes with it. You can trigger it with Amazon's a lady, right. And, uh, and just tell it to go. And there's all kinds of different modes. You can actually remote control it. If you, if you really want to like drive it around like a remote controlled car, you can tell it to just focus on one area or you can just tell it to go in auto mode, which means it'll just basically get the entire floor. I have this thing set to go at 3 a.m. every day, John. I wake up and my house is vacuumed every single morning. And that is blissful, man. It's a pretty cool little thing. And it works. It's uh, it, it's smart the way it does things. And what, what really amazed me is I had it, uh, you know, uh, like across the house. And it's got this little charging base and the charging base was not in the room that it was in. And I told it, you know, with the app on the phone, I said, go home. And it made like a beeline back to the charging base. And evidently it uses infrared at some level to line up with the charging base. But man, it was like magic the way that it just like it didn't have to hunt around for how to get there. It just knew. It was really, really crazy. So no GPS. Oh, GPS inside a house would be a disaster. No, it's not using GPS. Yeah. No, 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 no. Or why? No. Yeah, you wondered. No, I get it. Um, it Wi-Fi must just—it mag- just remembers. Or, or, I'm sorry. Infrared is magical because you can't see it, but other things can. Correct. Now you may ask yourself, how can I see infrared? And mm. some digital cameras, not the iPhone, though I think it used to, but many digital cameras, the uh, optical sensor in them sees infrared and you can tell if this is true for the one that you have take some of your remote controls and hold them up to your digital camera if you see a pulsing light you're seeing infrared it's that pretty darn makes cool. sense my current point and shoot camera does that so I, I would encourage you when when it's doing its thing is aim one of your digital cameras uh or point and shoot or whatever you got but anything except an iphone because it doesn't look like it works anymore sure. and you'll see the infrared you'll see the pulsing lights and it's, i believe it's it kind of cool that's but that, cool. that's a smart way to find out where something is so yeah yeah and the it's cool saying, part with infrared, here, but it doesn't bother you because it's infrared correct and the cool thing with infrared is it will reflect off of glass right you can try that mm-hmm. with your remote control at home right aim it away from your tv and again, this is assuming your remote control is infrared. A lot of remotes these days are like Wi-Fi or, you know, whatever. So just like if you have a Harmony remote, the new Harmony one, it, you know, that'll work from different rooms. But um, oh yeah, dude, but in the summer, I'm like having a blast because, yeah, I love bouncing my remote for my AC off of the walls and the yeah. floors and, and, the, and everything because light kind of does that. Yeah. Right, because light kind of does that exactly. Yeah, no, this RoboVac thing is really cool. Um, it's it's our first foray into that world, 
And it really is like one of the smart home things that has leveled things up in our house. Like it, it really? everybody in the instead, house loves instead this thing. of a instead of an iRobot product. That's interesting because I they're like this thing. Kind yeah. Of well, the, the iRobot stuff is super expensive. Super. Wow. Like you, you'll pay double the price for that that you will for the for these things. And I mean, okay. this thing just works great. Uh, we've had a couple. I mean, again, I'm doing this every single night at 3 a.m. The other night I was awake at 3 a.m. I'd gotten home from a gig and couldn't sleep or whatever. And I'm sitting in the living room on my laptop, just chilling out. And all of a sudden I hear beep, you know, and it's like it's this thing firing up. And it's like, the heck's going on? Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And occasionally we've woken up, uh, it, you know, and it said, oh, you know, the rollers are stuck or whatever. And it's because we left like a dog toy or whatever on the floor and it slurped it up underneath it, you know, like a little stuffed thing uh-huh. or something. But um but by and large, it's been, you know, it's totally fine. It's great. All right. And uh, but what do the pets think about it? Um, are they terrified or, or they're like, curious ab- okay. about it? Yeah, they, they they basically have learned to that it's part of the deal and they just leave it alone. But again, it's happening at 3 a.m. when the, when the everything, everybody in the house is kind of asleep and not there. Well, except the cats that are tearing around at 3 a.m. Cats generally don't. The cats sleep about really? 22 hours a day, John. They're, they're, they're like people oh, use really? the word nocturnal, but they're, they're just they just sleep. I think it do. was our friend Allison that posted a video at 3 a.m. And it's like, what are the cats doing? And it was just a video of cats just tearing around. And yeah. an IR camera was picking it up. And it's like, what are they, what are they even doing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that'll but happen sometimes. But but most, yeah, most of the time the cats are just asleep. They don't, you know, they don't have anything <laughs> better to do. It's stupid. All right. Uh, let's see. Moving on. Oh, yeah. I saw this on Facebook. In fact, our, our old friend Steve, who ran Comlink years and years ago, posted um, this cool little device. It's called the OB200, OBI200. And it's 48 bucks today on Amazon. Uh, It is a one port VoIP phone adapter. So the idea is you plug this thing into your, you know, via ethernet, you plug it into your router or whatever, and then it's got a phone port out of it. And here's the cool thing is that you can connect it to your Google voice number. So with this thing, you can make your landline in your house, quote unquote landline, answer when someone calls your Google voice number and you're not your Google voice number you can get for free. And this thing you pay 48 bucks for once and you're done. Um, they It supports all sorts of other services, too. But Google voice is one of them. And that's a pretty cool thing about this. Um, so. I I share because I thought that was a pretty good little find. He says he's been using it for years, which is uh, which is great. Yeah. So pretty good, huh? Yeah. 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 More options, the better. The more. I, yeah, exactly. Um, doubling back to. Oh, no. To your your con- your comment about the iPhone not supporting IR. Uh, PJ in our chat room at MacGeekab.com slash stream says the selfie cam. So the the front facing camera on the iPhone 10. Well, I'm not sure what iPhone he has, but uh, he says the selfie camera gets a little IR. The back cam gets none. And Michael King also in the chat room confirms that at least on the iPhone 10, the front camera works. But my guess is a lot of these front cameras will work on on your uh, on your iPhone. So check that out. That might that might be the answer to finding infrared. Good iPhone 10s for PJ. So uh, everything okay over there? I'm hearing all kinds of banging and microphonics. And are we all good, Mr. Braun? All right, I'm bringing us back in. John can hear us now. It's all good. Life is uh, life is a highway. We're gonna ride it all night long. Uh, let's see. Hey, they're right. Okay, there you go. Sorry, no, I I just. Uh change to the uh, selfie cam. And yes, as a matter of fact, I can see my AC remote control blinking its LED. Nice. Cool. Hey, thanks, guys. Yeah, I I thought the iPhone was a lost cause there. Now, that's weird. So I guess they're just using different sensors for, well, obviously, they're using different sensors for the front and back. Right, right. Why would they use one that picks up IR for one camera and not the other? Who knows? Well, my guess is they both would pick it up and maybe the front camera is tuned to show it for some reason. You know, like the software for the camera is tuned to show it. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah. Different no, glass, PJ says. Front facing camera. Oh, maybe yeah. it's maybe it's filtering. IR? Could be. 
Could very well be. It could be for the quality of the type of shot. Okay, yeah. that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it does. Good catch. All right, so it could, be a, it, it could be IR filtering a uh, glass there. Okay, but you can still use it to see the magic. You can nice. still use it to see the magic. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Let me know if right. you can see the magic with your with your phone once we're done. <laughs> I've, I've, once I'm done, yeah, I, yeah, I'm I, I'm gonna mess with my phone afterwards. But you guys keep doing what you're doing. It's all good. Sorry. Everything's there. <laughs> hey, uh, speaking of messing with phones, I not only like to mess with iPhones, I also like to mess with Android phones. Uh, and the reason is I like to keep up to date on you know what's happening on Android and how that experience is and all of that stuff. So I actually have two things to talk about here. Number one is one of my favorite brands to mess with is a company. They're the phones from a company called Doogee, or I think that's how we're supposed to pronounce it. D-O-O-G-E-E. These folks make killer phones with great big batteries in them. And usually with their own cases that keep them like super protected. And the prices on these are awesome. Like super Super inexpensive um, there. I, I was uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk about the S70, which was their phone that came out a few months ago um, in, in terms of some testing that I just did. And and this phone's awesome. It was, you know, a few hundred bucks or whatever. Uh, six in, well, five point nine nine inch screen. Right. Octa core, eight core, two point five gigahertz processor. Like this thing blows away the iPhone on specs. It takes better pictures than the iPhone. And it's just a few hundred bucks, like a 5,500 milliamp hour battery. So that's, you know, it's a monster and it's great, right? Wireless charging, all of that good stuff. Well, now they're uh, doing a Kickstarter for the next one, which is the S90. And I think 299 gets you yep they still have slots left hmm. you pledge 299 and you get uh, an s90 out of them and so now that's a 6.2 inch display uh an eight core processor again 10 watt fast wireless charging i mean it, this is an android phone so you have to bear you know like but these are good phones i've used them i've used them when i've traveled and stuff it's so i really like these doji phones and that that S70 blew me away when I when I started playing with it. I mean, I, and I've mentioned it here on the show a few times and on, on TDO as well. It's it's cur- my the S70 is my current go to Android phone when I need to test. Oh, something. look at all their. Oh, look at them. They have all these little add on modules. Oh, awesome. See? Yeah. Night vision camera, power mo- walkie. T- oh, my God. Game. Pa- what? Yeah, you can. Get, right. There's a game pad for the S70 that you can that you can put on it and it makes playing games great because you're not in. in posing on the screen and yeah it works out really really yeah. well yeah oh, and they got a real night vision camera look at yeah, that that's right see and, uh, so 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 in theory you should be able to take a gsm sim from whoever correct you sign up with and just pop it in here and you're good all right that's correct and it's yeah they've got multi like it'll take different size sims and all that stuff uh, you know because because sometimes that's what you want you know it's pretty good okay. yeah so anybody that offers Bring your own device, which I think pretty much all the major carriers do to some extent, right? Correct. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. So with that, I wanted to mention this because I just recently, it was just before the turn of the year, I started, really, I just, my son and I had a day to ourselves. The, the My wife and my daughter were away traveling or whatever. And uh, my son's 17 now. I was like, oh, we should go test drive cars. Because I'm like, ah, at some point in the next year, I need to get a new car. Well, I wasn't really thinking that testing, that going to car dealerships the week before uh, New Year's Eve was a time where they might really want to make some deals. And I really didn't want to buy a new car. There was no reason to. I could you know, buy a, a car that's maybe a couple of years old and it'd be great. Well, I wound up getting a deal on a Subaru Outback uh, 2018 that basically let me drive it off the lot with no depreciation uh because it was a new car, but it was the end of the year and they wanted to get rid of it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I'm driving now. And one of my uh, things that I wanted in a, in a new car was CarPlay. So yes, Lucas and I had a very successful uh, experience going out and test driving cars. It worked out that we actually took one of them home, but uh, CarPlay has been fantastic. I've used it in rental cars in the past. We've talked about it a little bit here on this show, but um but I've learned some things about CarPlay. And one thing that I've learned, one tip that I've learned is 
you'll probably still want to Bluetooth your phone to your car just in case you're in the car and you haven't plugged in or whatever. And you get a call or a text. You want it to appear, you know, on the screen and, and be able to use the microphones in the car and all that stuff. Well, here's a thing. Uh, CarPlay, the phone, and I've, I've found this true in any car that I've tested. Uh, so I don't think it has to do with the car. I think it has to do more with the phone. But the um, the phone will not connect to CarPlay if it has an active Bluetooth connection, at least with that car, where it's sending lots and lots of data. It will wait until that connection finishes, and then it'll do the CarPlay thing. So I was finding in my car that sometimes on short drives, CarPlay would never connect, right? Even though I plugged it in, it would the phone would never fire up the CarPlay interface. Because remember... CarPlay hmm. is just an extension of your phone's screen. Your phone's doing all the work. The car is just showing you the data. It's like the car becomes your iPhone screen, right? Only certain apps can appear and all that stuff. Uh, really? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I that's just how it works. It was like some sort of embedded software on the... So it's actually doing a... Okay, interesting. The yeah. Architecture. I mean, it, it, there is embedded software in the car to allow it to do the CarPlay thing, but that's about okay. it. The so car some smart... So they have to license it. And I think there's been some controversy over that. Right. So, yeah, so that's why I didn't want to get another BMW because BMW wants to charge people to use CarPlay. And I was like, no, screw that. Done with paying that tax. Okay. Well, because they so they think because we have to pay Apple to license it, then we should charge our customers. And it's like, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, they can. They, I'm just not going to be one of their customers. Oh, well, they, oh, well sure, they can. Yeah. But yeah. you may not have a lot of people really excited about that. So. Exactly. <laughs> So anyway, we've been really happy. We had another Subaru we've been really happy with. And so that's why we wound up with this. But what I found was, was this issue where CarPlay was inconsistently firing up. And sometimes it would take a few minutes. Sometimes it would never fire up. And I started thinking, you know, I have a lot of contacts in my phone, like a lot of contacts because I sync them all, you know, from my Mac. And we've talked about this, right? You know, I have a lot and it's caused some problems that have led to some great little solutions in the show. And I thought, you know, I wonder if the delay here in keeping CarPlay from firing up is my phone syncing all my contacts to my car. Because if you go in to Bluetooth, uh, you know, on your iPhone, settings, Bluetooth, and then hit the little I, you know, the info circle next to your car, you will see a few options. Um uh, most of the time, there's a slider for show notifications so that you can have your car display your notifications. And then there's also a slider for sync contacts. Below sync contacts, once you turn it on, you get to see your groups. Which groups do you want to sync to your car? And of course, I had by default all contacts enabled. And I thought, well, wait a minute. I don't need to sync all my contacts if 99% of the time I'm going to be working with CarPlay anyway, it gives me the option to sync just my favorites and recents. Like, you know what? That's enough. So I unchecked all contacts, the entirety of my CarPlay, in, you know, uh, uh, initiation problems immediately went away. Since then, 100% of the time I plug it in and within about three seconds, it's good to go. So the syncing of... The syncing of the contacts was keeping the phone from wanting to fire up CarPlay. Funny in that we, 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 it seems like we've had this conversation before, Dave. It's almost like Apple is doing inappropriate syncing of data. Well, it's not almost inappropriate. Like this is photos. Well, no, but you know what I'm saying? It sounds like they're trying to sync the entirety of your database rather than just maybe doing like a spot lookup when you need it. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Well, Versus no, yeah, but it has to. Because right. when a Bluetooth, the, the Bluetooth protocol, the way it, that it works is it just sends the phone number across to the car. It says, here's a call coming in from this number. That's it. That's all that it sends. So if the car doesn't already know how to look up and associate that phone number with a name, you won't get that name on the screen via okay. Bluetooth. With CarPlay, it, it, again, it's just your iPhone screen in the car, so it can just display. It doesn't have to sync. It's all right there on your phone. But this is okay. why you'd want to sync your contacts with your car. Um, it's just that if you have a lot of them, you have a lot of them. And that's okay. how life goes. But you see what I'm saying is that this may be another case where Apple's sinking strategy may not necessarily be the best. Um, I, I don't not. know that I, I can I blame I Apple for this. So. 
This isn't. Okay. This has nothing to do with CarPlay, other than that the Bluetooth activity kept the phone from firing up CarPlay. Because I dealt with this in my in my other cars too, where it would take forever for say music to start playing over Bluetooth because it had to wait until this sync of all these contacts was done. And of course, the sync was happening right. every time the car fired up fresh. Cars are weird these days, right? Like for four hours or so after you turn it off. They most of the newer ones generally tend to maintain some level of memory. So if you just get out of your car quick at the grocery store, you get back in. It doesn't have to do the resync. But if you leave it overnight, it does. So there you go. Uh, oh, not me, man. No, I, 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 I unplug my battery every night just to, you know, if there's any. Do you really from your car? Monitoring devices that, you know, I can. That's insane. No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> I like it. I'm, I respect it, That's, but it's kind of insane. So people have used it as uh, some people have said that doing that will will calm certain problems on older vehicles. Yeah, right. Disconnect the battery. Right. Well, from the yeah, like oh, it says check engine. Well, just disconnect the battery, and then that goes away. It's like well, yeah, it goes. There you go. I don't know if that's such a good idea. Check engine is probably telling you there's something wrong. Now you can either ignore it. Or put tape. I actually did this one time. I put tape over the light because it was annoying me. (laughs) But I eventually had the problem fixed. So I've had the opportunity now to mess with CarPlay, which I really like, Mm -hmm. especially, you know, uh, now that with iOS 12 apps like Waze and and others can really be first class citizens in in CarPlay, which is awesome. And Siri tends to work really well with with CarPlay and all of that. So it. So you can get so you can get ways on your car's display versus having to do it on your phone. Correct. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Outstanding. That's yeah. cool. That's and that's new as of iOS 12. They allow third party mapping apps to be used with with CarPlay. So Google Maps, Waze, um, both work as well as, of course, Apple Maps, obviously. Um, I've also because of these uh, this Doji F- S70 phone that I've been experimenting with, been able to check out Android Auto. Folks, if you have not been able to check out Android Auto, don't waste your time. Um, it CarPlay blows it away. Apple really does win this battle, at least at this point. Android Auto is very, very limited um, in. I mean, CarPlay is limited in what it can do, too. But the the experience of it is pretty smooth. Android Auto has been a mess. Um, and it's just very limited, like super limited in, in what can happen. And how and the the interface is very clunky. You can't get to things very easily. It 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 like over compartmentalizes stuff in a way that you can't really customize. So uh, I've been I've been very happy with CarPlay and and not at all happy with Android Auto. So so I share that. So if you haven't tested Android Auto, you don't have to worry about what you're missing. And I promise I'll report back if that ever changes, at least from my perspective. So that's that's what I have there. Thoughts okay. on that, John? So to sum it up, though, so I, I haven't done a lot of car play. I mean, yeah. I, I didn't have a very positive experience a couple of years ago at one of the, I think, CEA events in Manhattan. Where okay. I, I forget. The, I don't know if it was Ford or somebody else. I, I don't want to point the finger, but they were like, hey, our car is car play. And I'm like, oh, that sounds great. You know, let's check it out. And sure. it was just like failing on the show, which is normal for demonstrating things on a show floor. Of course. Because, what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to not work when you're showing it to tech journalists because right. then they can say bad things about you. But um, no, and it just didn't work that great. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm not impressed, but that was a number of years ago. So it sounds like they've refined it, but I guess to, to describe, I mean, when I look at their page here, I mean, it, it just, it, it's a offloading of certain phone features to your car's display. That's it's a, it's like, think of it as extended display from your iPhone for certain and, things. Yes. And AV, of course, your audio. and Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. Okay. And yeah. I see that they show, you know, so you can do phone music, but you can't do everything. You can only Correct. do certain things that they, they agree that are safe things to do while you're driving. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's frustrating is that, for example, an app like Glimpse would make perfect sense to have a CarPlay enabled version, right? That, that could do that. And they have oh, not, do, yeah, they have Glimpse not done that yet. Service. Right. Glimpse being a service that Dave and I often use, which will send I deleted a, it. Uh, I'm not going to use it anymore. Not until they have CarPlay. It's stupid. Oh, right. Yeah. 
because it's unsafe to have that thing running otherwise. But yeah, and and for what example, like Messenger, you know, I, uh, uh, messages on iOS, right? Uh, and and WhatsApp both work great with CarPlay, right? It'll read well, me my messages. I, I kind of disagree with it, it unless the car is not moving. Why would you even allow messages, or, or does it not allow that while the car is moving? Oh no, it's awesome. It reads so me my message. messages. It yeah. no, I don't see them. I hear them. It reads me my messages. It lets me respond via voice. Tells me if there's new ones. It's fantastic. Okay, and, but it, it lets you do it safely, and that it like will it let you enter? Do you see where I'm going with this? It's like, does it is it going to let you text somebody while you're driving? And it's like, yes, but using voice idea. commands only. OK, not not touch. OK, no. So if I tap the messages app, it says, who do you want to message? And I could say John mm -hmm. Braun. It's like, Great. and then it would ask me, what do you want to say to John Braun? And then I tell it and then it reads it back to me and it says, do you want to send the message? Okay. And I say, yes, my hands never leave the wheel. My eyes never I'm leave just, the road. OK, I'm just getting the thing that terrified you a number of years when you were driving with me. We were like, dude, you're like, you know, interacting with ways like while you're driving. A oh, car yeah. No, and that's a disaster. Okay, yeah. Fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. CarPlay does it right. And the and like the okay. uh, WhatsApp also works for messages. Facebook Messenger, no CarPlay functionality. It's like, oh, come on, guys. So there's things that need to get there. But, you know, hopefully they will. It's CarPlay's awesome. It really okay. changes. And you're saying the, the Android thing is in its infancy as far as that's probably a fair useful? assessment. Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. It may get better. Right. There's I mean, it's just software. So, uh, you know, the, the sky's essentially the limit. Hey, I want to uh, I want to talk about our second sponsor. Does that work for you? Fantastic. All right. I'd like to thank Captera for being a sponsor of this episode today. Do you remember 1989 when the World Wide Web was invented? You know, we've come a long way in 30 years. So why does it feel like sometimes the software that we use every day at work is stuck in the past? Take a leap into the future by finding the right software for your business at Captera.com. Captera is the leading free online resource to help you find the best software solutions for your business. They have over 700,000 reviews of products from real users. Discover everything you need to make an informed decision by checking out these reviews and finding the software that's going to work for you, no matter what kind of software your business needs, right? Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution quickly. You put in what you're looking for and they've got it right. And they tell you all about it. So you're not having to test a million things yourself, right? We do this here on the show. We have like cool stuff found. Captera is full of cool stuff found. That's what they have. So check it out. Join the millions of people who use Captera each month to find the right tools for their businesses. Visit Captera.com slash MGG today for free. And you can find the right tools to make 2019 the year for your business. Again, it's all free. Captera.com slash MGG. Captera. That's C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot -R com slash MGG. Just go. It's free. And you can support the show while doing it. Captera.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Captera for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. You know, we had a uh, question from Ed that talks about, well, Using Bluetooth in the car. So it seems like now's a good time to answer that question. Ed writes, I'm trying to figure out how to achieve a certain Bluetooth behavior in my car. My car doesn't have its own Bluetooth capability except for making phone calls. No music can be played through Bluetooth in my car. But I have an aux jack input where I could connect a Bluetooth receiver. The behavior I want is the behavior I find when I use my daughter's car. She has a Toyota RAV4, and I've paired my phone with her car stereo. Every time I get in the car and turn on the engine, the podcast that I've been listening to just starts playing. I don't have to pair my phone again with her system or even press play to continue listening. The podcast app is open, but not the active app, and it works even when my phone is locked. He says, I use Downcast as my podcatcher of choice. He says, I want to buy a Bluetooth receiver to put in my car. That has the same behavior, but I don't know what characteristics to be looking for in the receiver to make this happen. Can you explain what I need to specify in a Bluetooth receiver to get this? So this is a really good question. Um, near as I can tell, I actually did a lot of research on this, probably more than I should have. That's when I was up at like 3 a.m. 
um, messing with the, and the vacuum sprung to life. I was, I was digging into Ed's question here, but near as I can tell autoplay is controlled by the car or the receiver, but not the iPhone. And I, I'm, I'm fairly certain of this for a few reasons. Number one, lots of articles that I read at 3 a.m. while the vacuum was going. Um, but number two, uh, in my car, I have an option with Bluetooth to enable or disable autoplay. And that's a setting in, you know, the, the Subaru settings, not in uh, on my iPhone. So I'm pretty sure that's going to be the case universally. Um, I checked on Amazon. And looked at a bunch of different Bluetooth receivers, and none of them said one way or another whether they supported autoplay. So uh, I can't recommend a specific one. So it might take a little trial and error. It might take some asking of manufacturers. Uh, but I couldn't find anything that that said, "Oh yeah, and we either do or don't do autoplay." Some people don't like this functionality, as you might imagine, right? It's personal preference. Um, so I I think you're heading down the right path, but just Dig in. Maybe, uh, you know, Amazon lets you ask questions of other buyers. Uh, and most of the time people will answer those within about, you know, 12 hours, sometimes a little more. But uh, but maybe that's a good question to ask on on some of these there on Amazon. So that would be that would that's how, you know, there you go. That's how it works. Thoughts on this, John? Not really in the Bluetooth audio world, but um. I like the question. The only thing I would suggest is sometimes when you're trying to solve a problem like this, especially with older hardware, whether it be your car or your Bluetooth or your phone or whatever, is um, an analog solution, like maybe an on-off switch, maybe a way to complement. Well, he doesn't want an otherwise... on-off switch. He just wants to get in his car and have it start playing. No, I get it. What I'm saying is that for people that may not want always... Right. To always hear the last song that they played, you get yourself an analog switch. Which but how would you? I, I need to now. I need to ask because I'm not understanding. So if I have if, take CarPlay out of the equation, right? I have my iPhone. Right. It's paired with my car. I get in my car and it starts playing music. What analog on off switch? What are we like? How would an uh, analog would be, switch I would be prevent speaking this? of uh, in the case of taking a Bluetooth to auxiliary in mm -hmm. device if you don't want it to do the autoplay thing you get a little cutoff switch for it do you, do you see where i'm going with this i no? do but then your phone okay. but your phone will still be playing it right yes i and, I, I, and so I, it I'm, might I'm, mark that episode as played even though you haven't heard it so that could be right. and then it might play the next I'm, episode i'm just, I'm just devil's offering, advocate. Uh, yeah no i get it i'm, I'm just offering uh different perspective on solving a problem from a totally digital or computer right, standpoint right, is that right. analog may sometimes do it for you. Yeah. Yeah. I would That's be, I, again, I would be careful. I, I love, I mean, I, I like no, this I, back I and forth that we have. Saying. Yeah, it's good. Is that you don't want to circumvent the uh, features of the uh, system in place and that, Oh, well, did I play that or not? Well, right. I did, but I couldn't hear it. Right. No, I see what exactly. you're saying. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. No, it's good. I like digging in like this. Yeah. Yeah. I use when I'm on stage, I use um, and this might actually be handy because I've seen some of these Bluetooth things overdrive a uh, car's radio. Um, mm. When I'm on stage, you know, really? uh, playing music. Yeah. When I'm on stage playing music, I use in-ear monitors, right? So that I can hear what I need to hear without it having to be too loud and, you know, also protecting my hearing from everything else that's happening on stage. And what I do is those have just a nor they're normal headphone connector and I have a normal headphone connector that plugs into the mixer and all that stuff. In between that, though, I put a little $4 attenuator so that, and I tie that attenuator to my belt loop. And uh, and I use it so that I can have an easy, quick way to like just reach down right on my body and control the the level. And I usually turn the level on the board up to higher than I'd want so that I have some headroom and I can go up or down. I'm thinking that one of those little inline attenuators might well be the answer if you're having an overdrive issue where you just turn it down mm. and then it's keeping that level of signal, you know, from happening and and you don't get the distortion anymore. There you go. You know, but when you think about it, Dave, it's all about the levels. It's all no about the what levels. You're talking about in life. I mean, line level versus mic level, right? Yeah. 
I yep. mean, how much confusion has that caused for people? It's like uh, uh, about 40 dB. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's the difference, right? Between lie level and, uh, and, and low level. Uh, right? you're, you're the audio pro, not me. But, <laughs> but I know there are different levels. And if you plug the wrong thing in the wrong hole. Um, I think it's 40 it, dB. <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember now. Uh, but it's t- two different peak to peak voltages yes. that are used for different types of equipment. And the problem is you can plug one into the other. And if you do, you probably won't blow anything up, but it's going to sound terrible. It's going to be so bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. A lot of things have a switch that lets you pad the, you know, the signal to go up or down from mic level to line level. I, I think it's 40 dB. I don't know. I can't remember. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a lot is what it is. And you don't want to confuse the two. That's for darn sure. Uh, let's see, uh, where are we on time here? You know what I want to do, Mr. Braun? I want, I want to, let's talk about Andrew here. Let's do that quick. Um, Andrew says, I have a new 2018 Mac mini and discovered the following. Number one, it will not run anything older than Mac OS 10.13.x. And he says, boo to that. Well, I'll, I'll, le- I'll list his things and we'll talk about them. Number That's two, an interesting point. But we're going to we're gonna list them and Go. then talk about them. Yeah. Number two, you have to turn off security in order to access the internal SSD via target disk mode. And number three, uh, he says this is more a question than a discovery in target disk mode connected to a 2017 MacBook Pro 13 inch. The Mac mini will show up as an external hard drive. But if I try to install Mojave onto it. There's a notice that the, on the drive, uh, when I select the destination, that says I cannot install Mojave onto the drive because it's in target, target disk mode. What's up with this? And is there a way around this? And how do I remove all the system restrictions so I can proceed with workflows that I've been using with my Macs for years? Okay. So uh, to your point, John, yes, this is very interesting. And it, it I agree with you. It, um, it, but it makes sense, right? The Mac OS this machine was built and released in 2018. An OS that existed prior to its release probably won't have all the drivers that are needed to boot that machine. Makes total sense why 10.13 is... Or especially they got this uh, fancy pants T2 chip, right? Well, that's not... I don't think that's the reason that, that you need Mojave to boot it. But I think the T2 chip is the reason for numbers two and three here. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I don't I, like if the T2 chip is responsible for some part of it, not booting it, it it's not the only reason, right? Cause we've seen this it, generally most Macs cannot be started up from an operating system that predates that Mac, you, you know, even mm. right. I mean, we've, we've seen this over the years, you know, even if it's, if we're at 10 dot 11 dot one and a new Mac comes out, It'll be like, okay, here's a special build of 10.11.2 that knows how to boot that Mac. And then, you know, future public builds will also do it. Um, But yeah, that's, I think that's, I think that's pretty common. I think, I think, I think. (sighs) Right. Or have you, have you bought Macs and previous OSs can boot them? I don't think so. I I think it's, Uh, I've always experienced it that that you buy a Mac and like the, it, an OS that existed well, before it doesn't boot it. I'd I have to I, dig back into the midst of time. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, honestly. I mean, right yeah. now my machines are pretty close. I got a 2012 and a 2014 and they're both able to run the latest OS. So I don't really have a good frame of reference. Well, let's like look said, at you do. Let's look at Mac tracker, right? I mean, you know, the, the original OS on that machine we were talking about before the 2009 iMac is 10.5.6. Well, I don't think 10.5.5 would boot that machine like that. That, that it, I mean, I, I don't know about that one specifically, but my experience with every other Mac has been that, that it's like, mm-hmm. Oh no, 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 no. You need like, this is the minimum. Now this and everything forward will have the drivers right, for that. Right, right. Yeah. But it sounds like what they're doing is they're taking probably in part, because of the T2 chip, but maybe because they're like coming up with a new l- layer of architecture. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think what to call it here. Well, they're I mean, like, it could right, be, you know what this, yeah. this OS. Uh, yeah. Is that we're only going to run 10.13. whatever. 
Yeah. Sorry. Or later. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. So in terms of the T2 chip, though, uh, these other two things definitely are impacted by it. Um, in order to access the Mac via target disk mode, uh, by default, you cannot do that. Um, and you have to boot in. We talked about this at the show we did from CES, John, the startup security utility. And you get to this by holding down command R uh, and booting into recovery mode. And then once you're in recovery mode and you see the utilities window go to the utilities menu and choose startup security utility and from there then you have these options you can th this is where you could always set your firmware password stuff but now on the t2 equip max the t2 being this security chip that's in there that holds the keys for your hard drive encryption and all of that um, you have secure boot and external boot and uh, if you if secure boot is all the way on, I don't think with full security, I don't think you can see this thing in target disk mode. I think you have to go down to um, to no security. And then you also need to allow external booting uh, in order to do that. I, that that's that that seems to make sense with this T2 chip, because otherwise the Mac, I mean, it's built to keep people from messing with your Mac. Um so, and maybe actually, maybe secure boots, not the thing you have to turn off. I think it might just be external boot. You have to allow the external booting in order for target disk mode to work. So, yeah, and I, go ahead. I couldn't, I couldn't find it. You couldn't find what? The utility, the special utility. Uh, your Mac wouldn't need it, right? I know. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but we'll put a link need, in the show notes. Do I need to upgrade by 2014 though? Yes. Is question do you think so really sure i'll yeah. put it in my book for this year yeah there you go really i mean it did it, it pretty much well yeah oh, does it do what you want yeah does I mean, it feel podcasts, slow there's some entertainment titles that i cannot run because of the wimpy uh graphics oh. so um so maybe the answer is yes yeah there you go <laughs> I'll wait to see them in the refurb store. Are they in there? Yeah, that's smart. Uh, which, which in the refurb store? The Mac Mini? Well, 2018. No, Anything. not yet. I haven't seen them. It'll probably be another mm, that came out end of uh, no, November-ish. So you're probably looking at February, March before they appear in the refurb store. If, if history is an indicator. Um, now, in terms of not being able to install Mojave from target disk mode, Again, I think this has to do with the T2 chip. I think, and, and this is truly a guess, but it would make sense. I think you have to install Mojave from, from that machine, booting the, the installer so that it can coordinate the OS install with the T2 chip there so that the OS can unlock the drive when it needs to and get things booted. And I, my guess is that's why. Because it, remember, if you take the hardware of that disk, you know, the SSD out of any of these machines that run with a T2 chip, you cannot see the data on that. Like there's literally no way to see the data on that because you don't have the keys. The keys are not stored on the drive. They're stored in that chip. So I think that's why Mac OS has to be installed that way. That would be my guess. That would be my guess. <sighs> While you ponder on that, John, do you, uh, how, how do you feel about me doing, uh, one more sponsor spot here? Um, I'll, I'll ponder it and then let you know what I was pondering. <laughs> All right. I'd like to thank other world computing at maxsales.com for sponsoring this episode. You know, OWC is the place that John and I have gone. We still go for years. We've gone there to Get stuff when we need to expand our Macs, right? These people understand the technology that we all use every day because they use it every day. And then they engineer solutions that will actually work for the things that we need them to do. And of course, if they don't work, they totally stand behind it. But it happens so rarely that. It's not really a concern. So you got to check this out, right? Things like the new Envoy Pro EX from OWC, up to 2,800 megabytes per second of rugged portable SSD performance, right? That's the perfect portable powerhouse for demanding environments. And I challenge you to say that 10 times fast. Also, 
Go to OWC. Turn your iPad Pro into a workstation with their new OWC USB-C travel dock, right? You can use this to connect the display, access images from an SD card, even charge the device all through a dock that fits in your pocket. That's the OWC USB-C travel dock at MacSales.com. And, you know, that also works for your MacBook Air 2018, right, with a USB-C port, for your MacBook with a USB-C port, your MacBook Pro with a USB-C port. You got Thunderbolt 3? Cool. Get the OWC Mercury Helios FX, right? Connect that to any Thunderbolt 3 equipped Mac or PC for smoother frame rates, elevated gaming performance, an overall performance boost. If you take that new Mac Mini 2018, you add one of these with a killer graphics card in there and boom you've got like you know your own little kind of mac pro thing going on there and you can move it from computer to computer to enhance performance whenever it's needed most again check out MacSales.com for more information on all this stuff and really for anything it's where john and i go when we need to expand our computers and you can go there too MacSales.com. our thanks to mac sales and other world computing for sponsoring this episode any thoughts, my friend? No. Okay. All right. I just, I, you were pondering, you know, for the last couple of minutes while I was doing this. So I just, you know, wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. It uh, me. Paul, uh, Paul Franz in the, um, in the forums was asking a very good question. He says, with IPv6, you're no longer using NAT. Um says, will this reveal your internal address and is this safe? So Paul's right. Um, with IPv4, there aren't enough IP addresses to go around and assign individual real IPv4 addresses to all of our devices. So years ago, router manufacturers started employing this thing called network address translation, or as Paul called it, NAT, uh, that takes one public address and shares it amongst lots of internal IP addresses. And that's where we get our, you know, 192.168 or our 10.0 or, you know, whatever internal range you choose to use. This is how that all works. With And so that provides a level of natural firewalling because someone cannot attack your device like your, your Mac specifically because your Mac doesn't have its own address that's accessible from the Internet. It has to go through this, you know, the, your, your router because of the, the way that network address translation works. With IPv6, that changes. Every, com every device, not just every computer, every device, your phones, your, you know, cameras, whatever. If they're IPv6 capable, if your provider is IPv6 compatible, and if your router has IPv6 enabled, every device is going to get its own externally accessible IPv6 address. This means that your router has to be much smarter in terms of its firewall. Thankfully, most of them are. Um, it, there, it used to be that Max would generate, uh, would have like their own IPv6 address that they would generate based on the network they were on, plus their Mac address, like the hardware address of the network adapter. And they would never reveal that. Instead, a temporary IPv6 address would be generated I think every hour or something that it would use for outbound connections. That seems to have changed. That doesn't happen anymore. I think it changed in Sierra at some point along the way. Um, so the Mac only has one IPv6 address, but it's um, it's hashed in a way that it doesn't reveal your Mac address. So people can't know what type of device you're on. But they can know your, the one true address that your that your computer is accessible at. So that is exposed. Um, you want to make sure you're running a router that's you know got firmware that's up to date. Again, most router manufacturers are are pretty good about this. The default firewalls that are in place for IPv6 are all pretty solid. In fact, some might argue they are overprotective. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's much better to have to go in and open up a port than just have everything open all the time. Um, so I, I think you're pretty safe. But it is worth being fully aware that, yes, with IPv6 enabled, your devices now can just speak on the Internet. There's no network translation layer 
uh, happening anymore. Well, there it, it's still happening with uh, with your normal IPv4 address, but with any IPv6 stuff, it's not. And if you've enabled IPv6, I guarantee you've connected to websites directly. Um, you know, I know Facebook and Apple and several others run IPv6 as the priority. So if you can do it, they will do it. And you're just operating at that level. No, like no translation whatsoever. It's all just direct. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. Um, thoughts on this, John? I still see the notifications using hardware growler where it says, Hey, I got a new IPv6 address. And not as often as I used to. So, really? How, how often yeah. do you see those? Uh, usually when, you know, when I fire up the laptop in the morning or something, I'll see, or just when I'm using the computer every now and then, I don't know who's doing it. Is, is it my ISP? Is it the Eero? Oh, it could be your router reassigning something or, or your ISP. Well, do you or have a switch? Do you so, have so real have... IPv6 though, John, or no? Are you no. tunneling? Okay. Last that. Well, hold on. Let's look here. And how do we know that? How could we, how could we possibly know if we have IPv6, Dave? I, I go I'm to IPv, you. I go to IPv6 test.com. And yeah, I'm going to tell you where I'm going to go. And okay. it's not there, not because I want to disagree with you. Though. Sure. It's always fun. So it's fun. Sometimes. It's good for sport. But, yes. <laughs> but basically, I'm looking at the uh, uh, Doxis status page on my cable modem. And you may ask yourself, how do I get to this page? And it's at 192. So you run your favorite browser and you go to 192.168.100.1. And it's going to give you all sorts of fascinating statistics. Like I have 24 downstream channels. Isn't that cool? And four upstream. <laughs> but um, then on one of the pages here, I think, is it event log or CM state? But there's one page here. All right. Where basically it says, all right, attempts to get a IPv4 address, five. Attempts to get a V6, none. So there are certain pages on the status page for this modem, which have the word IPv6. And whenever they say that, the number next to it is zero. So I'm going to um, conclude that I I'm not cannot... I'm not convinced that's yeah. telling you whether or not your provider would support it for your connection, because it's possible if I were to if I were to go along with that, then I would tell you that my provider doesn't support IPv4 because my cable modem does not connect via IPv4. It only connects via IPv6 to Comcast. Huh. So I, I think that tells you how your cable modem is getting its address. But I don't think that necessarily indicates whether your router or devices past it can use IPv6. I could be wrong about this, but I, I didn't think that was the, the way to, to do it. I, I, I mean, I think the way I've tested it is, you know, you, you look up your, uh, well, you look up your ISP, figure out what people say they've used and turn on that type of IPv6 in your router. And it might be that there's there's a few different ways of connecting to IPv6. One is um, DHCP V6. Oh, one I is, did that. Yes, I did a tunnel at one point, but I don't I don't anymore. So, OK, yeah, all you right, say you is can I, tunnel. I, I went to yeah. what is my IP and it says your public IPv4 is this. So it does. The, 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 what is my IP doesn't realize that I'm on that doesn't think I'm on IPv6 well as far as I can see yeah it, it, but if you even if your provider supported IPv6 if you didn't turn it on in your router what is my IP.com would also say the same thing right it's because it's you're right. not going to get an IPv6 address unless you turn the thing it is on. I'm almost certain if I look at my, uh, so what am I running? You may ask John and uh, I'm running arrow and I'm pretty sure I turned it on in arrow, but I'll look again. here. Yeah. So. so we run the arrow app network settings and I'm almost certain IPv6 is at least the arrow app thinks it's on. So okay. I'm not disabling it from my router. So I, I don't think. Uh, no, I don't um, think you, I, I don't think online. your ISP supports it. That's right. Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I believe you. The regular row of the tunnel thing. It was easier on other devices. The, the, for whatever reason, the arrow doesn't seem to make IPv6 tunneling easy, or at least I don't think it does it. I don't. I, I don't think that's an because my last router was the um, 
Yeah. What, what did I have? The, uh, the T- you had a TP link. link. Yeah. Yeah. But it actually had a thing where it's like, Hey, you want to do a tunnel? So it looks like you got IP or, or right. we'll make you have IP, IPv6. And it's like, yeah, sure. But uh, Eero doesn't do that at this right. point. And right. Uh, no, no, fine. I'm, I'm okay. Yep. I mean, for a while we were talking about how IPv6 is like, you better use this or it's like the end of the world. I don't know if it's the end of the world, but it's something that if you can run it, you should run it. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, it 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 helps the Internet move forward at the very least and and may may give you faster, quicker connections, lower latency connections. Oh, really? Maybe. Well, think- your router's not having to do any routing, right? It's just mm-hmm. passing. It's not having to do any translation. It will still be doing routing, but it won't have to do any translation. So there, that's another layer you get to take out of the mix. So maybe it's faster. Right. You know, I mean, I still like the kind of dynamic remote IP like secure connection thing, Majiggy. That, that's cool. Say that right? again. Well, the thing is where you can give this IPv6 address to somebody and then kind of they can kind of we, we, we fiddled with this yeah. a while back, but yeah. I haven't really used it since then. I yeah. don't know. No yeah, reason no. to, but it's like, you know, per, it, 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 I don't know if I'd call it a virtual VPN or virtual remote access. I don't know. It's not virtual. I mean, it is remote access. Like, that's the beauty of it is you don't need. Right. You can just connect. You're good. You're right. But and the, that's and the and risk. It's, it's such an incredibly huge, complex number that nobody's ever going to guess it. So it's like, all right. And yeah, it keeps there, changing it. That's right. Well, it doesn't keep changing, though. It used to. Now it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. The, and that's yeah. what we're talking about. Yes. Because I used to correct. see, well, or, or does it just not change it as often? Hmm. We'll have to uh, think I don't think it changes it ever. Unless, unless your internet provider changes your IPv6 prefix, in which case then, yes, it does change. But otherwise, no, it's a static thing. Because I use right. IPv6 locally here amongst my devices and it works great. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. All right. Uh, Let's see. Where are we here? Do we have? Oh, yes. This was a question Mm -hmm. that came up a couple of times, John. You answered Bill's email about it. And then there was also a post in the forums about it, too. Yes. Um, And and Bill, it was we had talked uh, in the last show about how uh, some drives are AP uh, APFS formatted because they were migrated from HFS plus and some were APFS formatted from scratch. And how do you tell the difference? That's basically the question that came in uh, in various different ways. So do you want to take us through how you answered it for bill, John? Sure. Hold okay. on. Let me cool. Pull up here. I'm kind of dealing with like three things at once here. You know how that goes? Maybe we'll finish doing the show. Then you can deal with the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll do that. It's Sounds good. Like- Sounds good. We're almost finished here, John. So, you know, it's, it's no, I know we're in the home okay. stretch here. Yeah, that's the idea. Wait, where is where is he? There he is. All right. So good question from a bill. Dave and John, during the discussion about APFS. Well, you don't have to answer. You don't have to read his question. We've already set it up. Just to answer the like, just answer. How do you tell if the drive is APFS, APFS from scratch or APFS from HFS plus? And my reply was. The message on how you can tell a volume was APS, APFSified comes up when you run disk first aid. And the thing is, we didn't mention that. We had the screenshots during the question. Right. The thing is, during disk first aid, if you run that on a partition, and as far as I can tell, it, 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 it'll, you should probably highlight the lowest level device that you can to get the mo- most information. You see where I'm going with this yeah although in my experience it doesn't matter you can just highlight oh, the volume right. and it'll tell you but uh, yeah I, okay. I like the idea yes right yep right because you may get less information if you if you go to a higher level device so anyways right, right. um what happens is you're going to see in disk first aid when you run on the partition it's going to have a line that says the volume blah 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 was formatted by Probably something called HFS underscore convert. And then it gives you a version number here. It's 748.1.46. It's like 748, really? And less modified by APFS underscore KEXT. So, and then there's a, another line after that, which I gave him as well. But the thing is, Dave, 
HFS underscore convert is the thing that did this. So I would say that it was a converted volume versus a freshly formatted volume. Now, I don't have the text of what happens. If I do. It's freshly. If it's freshly formatted, yeah. it will say the volume was formatted by new FS underscore APFS. <sighs> so it's really obvious w- which way this this went. Um, you have to. Yeah, you got to let the, the whole disk utility thing run. But yeah, then it'll be in there. Yeah, yeah. That's the what does bother me is that then he had a little follow up saying, all right. So so the thing is, you can also in this utility highlight a volume and then click on uh, there's going to be a little circle with an I in it, which means in almost every world info. And it's like, give me more info. And it's like, okay, let's do that. The odd thing, Dave, that I noticed that he noticed and I noticed and I don't know if you noticed or you can try it right now is that if you get the info, it says, oh, by the way, this disk isn't bootable. And sure enough, when I went through my MacBook Pro, which has a bootable, last I checked, like five minutes ago, <laughs> APFS formatted volume, it also said that it wasn't. So I don't know if it's a bug in disutility or they got a flag set wrong or it just explains. So I'm not running the, Mojave on the podcasting mm-hmm. machine, but right. I I am seeing the same thing. I am seeing info for it my boot, boot drive that says it's not bootable. That's right. Yeah. And yet you booted from it recently. Yeah, but here's the interesting thing. If you look at the true structure of the disk, right, and and go um, to, if you go to the view menu and go to show all devices, you'll see that there's a container above the disk itself. And is that container bootable? No. Okay. So that's not, uh, is the disk itself bootable? No. No. So, okay. So nothing's there. It, nothing's bootable according to this, which is of course wrong, but I, I, there, there's like, there's different layers of APFS uh, things. And I don't even think, even if you go in disk utility to the view menu and say, show all devices, uh, I don't think you're seeing everything. And it, it's possible that the thing that's actually booting your Mac is not one of these things that's appearing here. I it, it it in that it might be that this get info thing is actually telling you something accurate. It's just misleading. That's all. I think. I don't know. It's weird. It's Apple. You know, they don't. We don't always get to see everything. And APFS, even if you boot, even if you uh, format from scratch as APFS, it's still you know, it's still a little hidden. So that's that's what I got. Anything else, my friend? I think I lost him. I don't know. He's going to come back. But uh, in the meantime, I'm going to get us out of here. And John will join us again, I, I think, at some point. He has this problem with Discord where it just stops letting him hear anything. Nobody else I do Discord with has this problem. But John definitely oh, does. Oh, that was exciting. See, I told you. I told you he'd be back. Um, feedback at MacGeekGab.com is where you can send in your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, anything like that. Hopefully John heard me. I think I heard you, Dave, in that um, before my Discord just violently crashed, but I'm back. You said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I did indeed say feedback at MacGeekGab.com. That's where you can send all that stuff in, unless you are a premium supporter, in which case premium at MacGeekGab.com is the address that you get to use. Everyone can use the phone number 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is 433 and you can find us on the forums. We mentioned them a couple times during the show. It's at MacGeekGab.com slash forums. Lots of activity happening there. Someday, John F. Braun's even going to join us there. Today, probably I did once isn't and I that day. I, I will. I, I promise. There we are. Good. It really is a good place to, to, to hang. We like to hang there. Uh, yeah. Uh, I want to thank all of our sponsors, of course. Uh, and 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 first, I want to thank Cashfly for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. The sponsors, of course, in this episode, as we mentioned, Hair Club at hairclub.com slash MGG. Captera at captera.com slash MGG. Otherworld Computing at macsales.com. Of course, the good folks at Smile, smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Barebones Software at barebones.com. Eero at eero.com. It's all good. It's all good. Have a fantastic week, folks. 
Thanks for everything. Seriously, thanks for everything. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling your friends about the show. That that helps a ton. John, I know you had a couple of issues in the middle of this episode where you might have detached and come back. I I hope that your week goes smoothly and that you don't get caught. made up.